Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by who? Cheshire Impact. Who are these guys? We're on a mission to help you maximize your use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Now, my guest today, so exciting. So exciting. It's someone I've seen speak at different events, ABM events. In fact, the kind of speaker where you're tweeting every other sentence he's saying, he is the president of Heinz Marketing. There's a hint for you. Host of the Sales Pipeline Radio. He's a keynote speaker, an author, a father. Matt Heinz, how are you, sir? I'm great, Casey. How are you? Good, good. Welcome. I'm so thank glad you're you here. So oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm, I am excited. Um, this is the, probably the highest energy marketing podcast I know of, so it's an <laughs> honor to be part well, thank of Thank you, because I know you're, you're on podcasts, you're on stages, you're everywhere. And, well, and I'm also six cappuccinos in, so I'm trying, I'm trying to raise to the level of, of what I'm joining here, yes. See, I feel like I need to try to one-up you, but I, I got one of those venti uh, iced coffees, and I had them throw in that espresso shot because it was a free, you know, it was like a gift yeah. thingy. Yes. So I, I think we're on the same wavelength here. It's good. It's good. Everyone okay. listening will have no idea, but we'll be good. No, it's not a competition. It's not, it's okay. <laughs> it's not that you win or I win. I think we're just, we're just both jacked and excited to be here. Both jazz, man. So the theme for this crazy jazzy conversation we've got going on here is around that maturity model. You and I were talking about you're developing one for marketing. We've got one we've developed for just marketing automation, like focusing in on how do you develop marketing automation to really maximize it. We've had different themes every month. Now we're getting onto the really fun, crazy advanced stuff, the, right, mm -hmm. the idea of personalization. And then I know, you know ABM ties into that, really just customizing the journey to the person going on it, to the buyer. Right. And I want to just kind of pass you Thor's hammer here <laughs> and see if there's any myths, any bogus strategies. Yes, yes, you've received the hammer. The hammer. What, are you, what are you hearing out there that just drives you crazy? You want to smash it right away. So there's a couple things that come to mind when I think about that. The first is... Uh, I am tired of hearing people say that things in B2B sales and marketing are dead. Uh, yeah. I've heard people say cold calling is dead. I've heard people say direct marketing is dead. I've heard people say email is dead. Someone told me recently that content marketing is dead. ABM is dead. Oh, for the most part, I think people that say things are dead are mostly trying to get you to buy what they think the alternative is. Yes, right? they are. And in, in, oh, in the problem is that the very few things are actually dead. Like you can mm. still cold call, but like bad cold calling was dead 20, 50, 100 years ago. It's dead on arrival. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so I think that that's the thing is that when people say something's dead, what really means is like doing it in a bad way, like doing a shitty job. I don't know if I'm allowed to say shitty on this show. You can swear. This is the hardcore marketing show. All right, good. This is, this is great. So if you are doing a <laughs> shitty job at cold calling, if you're doing a shitty job with your content, yeah. that is dead on arrival, right? Yeah. And so, but I think if you are thoughtful about what you're doing, if you are externally focused, if you're a customer centric and how you are approaching any of those things, it is, it is very doable. So my first, my first myth to smash is that things in B2B are dead. I guess the second is the idea that, that, uh, that, that a lot of people talk about alignment between sales and marketing, Sure. especially from the marketing standpoint, they say, oh, we're revenue responsible and we're, we're going to sales kickoff and we're aligned with, mark, with sales organization. There is a big gap between being strategically aligned and operationally aligned, mm. right? Like to say that your that your goals are the sales team's goals, that's one thing. But what does that look like on Tuesday? Like on Tuesday right. morning, what are you doing to operationally align? What tactically are you doing? It's the let's say it's the last week of the quarter. Most yeah. marketing teams are done. They're like, ah, oh, we generated our leads, we're all done. What are you doing in the trenches with your sales organizations to get those deals done? Right. What is that's what, crunch time for them, right? Well, it's crunch time for you as well as marketing. True. True. Right. I mean, like, so let's, let's say there's a deal you're trying that Marcel is trying to get across the line yep. and you've got one member of the buying committee that still isn't totally bought in. Mm. What is their objection at that point? What's keeping them from going and how can you as marketing create content for an audience of one yeah. to get that deal going? Don't just count on your sales team to do it. Give them the support that you are, that you are uniquely, you know, enabled to provide. I, I think that is one of many examples of operational sales and marketing alignment that I would love to see um, far more often. What do you think? Do you start with a strategic alignment and then you? Yeah. How do you have you to? Need I mean, like, both. It sounds like you need both. But what? Well, I mean, if that? you if if you did not have some strategic priority to align with sales, 
but you were still willing to jump in and create content for an audience of one in the last week of the quarter, then that's what really matters, right? Mm. Like, so to a certain extent, let's say you don't have, like, it's not a CMO directive to be operationally, you know, strategically aligned, but you as a field marketing person are still going and doing the right work. The right work with the right impact is still all that matters. My point is that if you are, if you're strategically aligned, but you're not doing the hard work, if you're not doing the sausage making that actually makes a difference, I don't care about your PowerPoint slides. I don't care about your, your SKO rallying cry. It doesn't <laughs> work. Yeah. Or the t-shirts you sent over. Any, <laughs> right. You know, it's a really good point. You know, if you had to pick one, it, you know, it's kind of empowering too, right? For that marketer, maybe they don't even know how do you even approach. I mean, CMO hates the, the VP of sales and vice versa, but yeah. you're, you know, you and sales just on the, on the ground level want to work together. If you can yep. support them, Yep. Start making change on your own without necessarily waiting for commands from on high to you know allow this to happen. Well, uh, yeah, and and I think that if you d if you take that step over to the sales side, you provide that kind of support. Sales teams are not used to seeing that. They're not used to they're not used to right. having that kind of support, and so you will start to receive such enthusiastic feedback from the sales organization, from sales management, from sales leadership, even if you don't have strategic alignment, I guarantee you, your, your manager, your leaders in marketing are going to start to hear about, wow, sales really loves marketing. Why are they loving marketing? Well, it has nothing to do with the MQLs you just generated. It has everything to do with getting in the war room and trying to get deals closed. What, what are some good ways that they can do that, right? So let's say you've decided you want to help the operate. You just want to help sales out. Maybe you're not really exposed to them. Yeah, how would you approach that? I'm, I'm a rock star marketer. I want to get in there, get in the trenches with sales. I don't want to be annoying. Right. I want to help get that deal over the finish line. I would start with kind of a structural way of doing that, that mm -hmm. where, where sales understands how and where you could get engaged. So I think most organizations are used to marketing owning the top of the funnel. Yeah. And then when something becomes a qualified lead, it gets thrown over to sales with some right. collateral and then sales owns it. So most companies take the funnel and they split it horizontally. So marketing owns the top and sales owns the bottom. I would encourage you to take a shot at splitting the funnel vertically moving forward. So that at each stage of the funnel, like stages of leads, stages of opportunities, there's a marketing job and there's a sales job. Now it may be that at the top of the funnel, marketing is leading and sales is supporting or following and then the sales side vice versa. But to your question, let's take just those opportunity stages. It, 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 what is sales specifically trying to do at each of those stages to move someone along? That should be defined already. But if you were to sit down and put another cell next to it in the spreadsheet and say, well, what is marketing doing there? What could marketing do huh. at those stages, right? If I'm at the stage of, you know, I've already done the demo and I'm working through objections and trying to get, you know, justify the decision. Does sales have the right validation points? Do they have the right evidence of success with other customers? Do they have the right case studies? Not just, oh, look at our website and they got case studies. Well, I'm trying to close a mid-level manufacturing company. Do I have any manufacturing case studies? Do I have any mid-level company case studies? Do I have more precise, more relevant content that right. maps to that customer? And when I say case study, I'm not talking about like some five page fit and finish, whatever. Yeah. It could be a 15 minute video clip. It could yeah. be a segment, you know, an audio segment. It could be just a quote. Um, it could be, you know, it can be in a variety of formats. So I, long story short, you know, there's, there's the acts of sales alignment around sort of creating that content for an audience of one, but then there's the, if someone's at the demo stage, here's a checklist of things that marketing could do, right? That maybe sales agrees to in advance. And then for each individual deal, you go to your rep and you're like, okay, we're at the demo stage. Tell me about the, the deal you're at. Does one of these bullets make sense for us to dig in and, and execute for you? Right. Interesting. I love the idea of splitting it vertically instead of horizontally. Everyone does it horizontally. Yeah. If anything, sometimes you don't even have a funnel, right? You're not even talking to sales, but in this case, I own it, you own it. It's almost like, it's my ass on the line. Oh, quick, throw it over, hot potato. Now right. it's your ass. If you can't close that lead, that's your bad. You know, I sent this amazing lead over. But instead, you're saying, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to maintain some sort of, you know, uh, iron in the fire the whole way through. And in, right. when we're thinking about the top of the funnel, that was such a great point because I'm thinking, okay, marketing tends to own that. But some of your best ideas, like what, what questions are people asking? You know, mm -hmm. like sitting in on a sales conversation or, or they're saying, hey, man, everyone keeps asking me who we are. Can, yep. we, can we get some high-level content for them so I don't have to answer that stupid question every time? Let's well, not only that, but also, you know? you know, teaching salespeople how to build rapport with prospects early on by bringing insights, by reframing problems. You know, I think 
instead of asking your prospects what keeps them up at night, which a lot of salespeople see mm -hmm. as sort of a favorite consultative question, what if you were to step in and tell your prospects what should be keeping them up at night? Yeah, right. right. You know it well enough where, I mean, and, and the, one of the ways I've seen companies do this is, you, you know, you say, hey, listen, I get a chance to talk to people in your position all day long. And when I ask them what keeps them up at night, I hear the same two or three answers. Right. And here are they, right? And so it could be like, it could be that someone hadn't thought about those, but they're like, oh, I hadn't thought that. If, so my peers, you're telling me all of my peers think that number two is a priority. I hadn't thought about that. Tell me why they think that, right? And so now you're in an educational mode. Now you're in um, sort of a challenging the status quo mode with that prospect where you are leading the conversation based on pain points that specifically map to problems you and your product and service can solve. I still haven't told you what I do. I still am not anywhere close to a demo, but my prospect right. is now interested in learning more about a problem that they probably have that we can help solve. Right. And you built that rapport to the point where they're, but yeah, I'm actually, you know, they're asking you for it. You know, I, I, have you read the challenger sale? Cause that sounds very yeah. similar to the idea this, of this like very much. Yeah. So the, the challenger sale was the latest you know, tool uh, to help codify this. Um, there's a book called mastering the complex sale by Jeff mm. Dahl. It's a it is complex book too. It's pretty approach. big. It is, it is quite large book. Yeah. The, um, you know, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. Not yep. that different either. Right. It's like focus on the other person and don't just be an active listener and don't just ask questions, but the nature of what you're saying and sharing and asking can make a big difference in whether someone not only is engaged with you, but how much they see you as valuable. Part right. of them. And it's a good point. If you're talking to or actively working with the same personas day in day out you should have learned something by now about what they're all going to say ideally you know what they're going to say before they even say it and right. so instead of being the i have no idea tell right. me your problems you know well, it's, and it's a point of it's, it's a point of focus and qualification as well true so you know you can focus the conversation on one of those two or three things fairly quickly by asking the question also if you have a prospect that says nope none of those are a problem then maybe you have an unqualified prospect and you should hang up the phone and go talk to someone else. Yeah. Right. If you ask them what keeps them up at night and they could be, you know what it is? Um, it's my wife snoring, right? Or something that is totally off the map that is not something Guilty. you want to talk about. Um, <laughs> don't, don't open-ended questions like that lead your prospects to bring up all kinds of stuff that is not relevant to your conversation. That's and so true. even though you're having that loosening of the status quo kind of a moment, even though you're asking those challenger insight, you know, reframe kind of questions, you still want them to be focused enough that eventually it's easy to pivot to, you know, everything we've just been talking about, all the, all the things we've just been talking about the last 20 minutes, that's actually what we do. We solve, we, our company solves that problem for organizations like yours all over the world. If, if you're interested, I'd love to show you now how we do that. Mm -hmm. So that why to what to how is a better progression to get someone motivated and interested in actually seeing what you do. Okay, break this down. Why to what to how? Yeah. So the why, I mean, think of this as the, uh, you know, the, you bring up the challenger sale. Yeah. Challenger's mantra is teach, tailor, take control. Hmm. So create a teachable moment for your prospect that introduces an insight. Let's say, for instance, uh, so actually, we'll give you a specific example here. The, the last company I worked at before I started this we were selling PC power management software. So it was Woo, software that, yeah, I know, super. So it was uh, <laughs> software that sat on the servers. But you know what we knew is, and what most companies didn't know is that 40% of the energies PCs were consuming were powering the PC when no one was sitting in front of it. So when you go to the bathroom, when you go to really? a meeting, when you go home at night, when you leave for the weekend or vacation, your PC, it wakes itself up or it stays on and the monitors stay on. So there's power settings that are inconsistently set on PCs all over. This problem still exists. 40%? 40%. So Dang. look at what you did. So that's a teachable moment. You're like, yeah. I didn't know that. Holy crap. That's a big number. Yeah. Right? And so then you can say, okay, now let's go and calculate that uh, in your organization. So I've gone yeah. from the tailor. So there was a bank, um, it no longer exists space in Seattle. You can probably figure out which one that was. And they, back in the day, like they were a big <laughs> prospect of ours for this. And we did the math. We did a, we did a pilot program with a very small percent of their, of their computers. We came back and said, did you know that on an average basis, the PCs in your network every business day are wasting $35,000 in energy when they're not being used? $35,000 oh. a day, every day. So we think our, our, in, in, our, in our history, in our, in our example, in experience with other, with other financial services firms, we believe we can save two thirds of that energy for you. So call that, let's call it just to be safe, $25,000. You know, $25, so would it be valuable for me to give you 25,000 in pure margin every day back to your bottom line? 
it's no longer about software, is it? It's no longer <laughs> about like, where's the money? I mean, that's a conversation that quite frankly, we, we would have with CFOs and they would look yeah. at the CIO and just say, friggin' get this done. Cause I got a yeah. drink. <laughs> yeah. I want this story, you know? I'm ready to do it. I only have a laptop right here. So <laughs> yeah. So, so what's interesting is, you know, it, it, at that point, like we haven't even really gotten into how it works, right? Like I told you at the beginning, it was a software tool, but even if I would have left that out and simply started with, did you know how much energy PCs waste? Yeah. And do you know what that actually means extrapolated for your organization and the opportunity cost of not solving this that we think we can extract for you is $125,000 a week in Jeez. pure margin. So now you're listening and yeah. it could be hardware, software, pixie dust. Maybe I cast a spell on your PCs and it magically works. I mean, at this point, you don't, Doesn't like, even that's, matter. All, that's, all, <laughs> that's all the, that's the, that's the how, yeah. right? So the sure. why is the teach and tailor. Yep. And so I mentioned that the, the, the challenge of progression is teach, tailor, and take control. The take control part comes from if I have now told you and if you now believe that you can save $125,000 in margin a week, I've earned the right to take control of the deal. Yeah. Not based on my sale, but based on your objectives. Like yeah. if you were a couple of days late in responding to edits on a proposal, I'm like, well, you just spent another $50,000 you didn't have to because you were late getting me edits on the proposal. So I can be a little more assertive because I'm mm. pushing the agenda that the prospect themselves have agreed to, where you've gone from a challenging of the status quo to a commitment to change. I am committed to solving this problem. I'm committed to getting that money back. Right. Like those CFOs saying, go, just do, do. Yep. Let yep. me know if anyone gets in your way. Let's just yeah. get this thing. What do we need to do? What are the next steps? And you're like, exactly. okay, this and this and this, and I'll send it right over. Yep. Exactly yeah. Right. Dang. So, Man, you're, you're, you're sales savvy. Has that helped you know, the knowledge of the sales side, being a better marketer and marketing, yeah, yeah. you know, the combination? It just sounds like that, you know, knowing more about the other side can just blend. It's really one continuous process, you know? And anytime so, so a, a recent grad or an almost grad graduate in marketing, you know, wants to go into marketing or B2B marketing, they say, like, what should we do? Mm -hmm. um, I have three pieces of advice. I say, first, read voraciously, like be intensely curious and re make reading a daily habit. Two, start writing, start creating content, start creating a paper trail of what you think, creating a paper trail of your ideas and your opinions and your thoughts so that it'll help you better organize your thinking in a productive yeah. way, but it'll also show other people how you think. And number three, go work in sales. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a really good B2B marketer, get a BDR job, get an inside sales job, go carry a bag for a while. Yeah. Not only as a young person fresh out of school, can you make a crap ton of beer money? Like as your good BDR, as a good inside sales rep, you will be so much a better marketer. You will have such better empathy for not just what the sales process is, but also what salespeople go through. Yeah. On basis. So, I mean, until I started this business, I mean, I'd never had a sales role. I've never yeah. carried a bag. And you know, for, for 10 years now, like I'm the primary sales guy for Heinz marketing. So I've learned very directly, you know, how to manage sales and how to manage, um, disappointment, uh, you know, in the pipeline when <laughs> happen the way you want them to. Yeah, sure. Um, but we do, I, I think, you know, as, as part of what we do, you know, we're, we're, it's mostly CMOs that hire us to help build predictable pipelines, but the best engagements work because we're working in very close contact with sales, with the, with the right. vice president of sales, with the, with the sales managers. Um, it has to integrate together. If it is just a marketing centric initiative, it doesn't have nearly the same potential for success. Right, right. And then you're in that silo, it's unbalanced, and you can do a whole bunch of wizardry on one side of the equation. Yeah. But if you don't have the other side, it, it's going to fall flat. I mean, you're going right. to hit a wall. That's right. Huh. Go work in sales. That, you know, I can, I can relate to that. I, I had a quick experience where I was trying to get a marketing job and this, this uh, CEO of a tuxedo company invited me to go to bridal shows. Okay. Help sign up brides and grooms to come get their tuxedos from the shop. And yep. it was one of those things where you got to get them to give you a totally refundable $15 <laughs> deposit, right? And yeah. there are all these questions and you... And all those lessons, and one of the things you brought up earlier was, you know, qualifying people to make sure you should even be talking. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're bringing up the different challenges that you've heard and they're not fitting any of them, yeah. you don't need to try to bend them into being a good prospect. That's right. Let them go. Maybe recommend yeah. they go somewhere else or help them find their way. Um, but I, I learned that early on. I, I tried to convert everyone, right? I tried yeah. to make everyone a customer, whether they needed it or not. Right. That's not really the right way to go. So you, yeah, you're right. right. There's so many lessons you get from just being on that other side, 
you know, facing down the rejections and the weird mind games and the, the human interaction on the sales side. What we want, you know, I think if, if you've never been in the trenches, if you've never really sort of experienced firsthand how the sales sausage gets made, so to speak, you think that it's simple. And I, and I think right. that, you know, you, you build your list and you send your emails and you want them to be clean and your work is focused on greater open rates and then you've got your leads and you pass them off. And, it, you yeah. know, from a marketing standpoint, I think marketers want that to be clean and efficient, um, but it isn't. And so it's frustrating to marketers when sales comes back and says, well, I know you counted that as a marketing qualified lead, but that's not someone who has the problem we solve. Or that's not someone at a company that's ever going to have the budget for us. Or I know you said you generated all these new marketing qualified leads, but half of them are repeats. I mean, and you want me to follow the full <laughs> follow up process, but I did that last month to the exact same lead. And so that's frustrating to marketing. They're like, well, we're trying our best, but like, you don't understand like this, you should go focus on something else as a marketer that can deliver better results. Um, I, you know, we were talking at the beginning of this about sort of the operational sales alignment and sales yeah. enablement function. You know, some enterprise marketing teams I've seen de put a decreased focus on lead gen, which has always been sort of the primary metric and focus of marketing, Interesting. and put an even greater focus on sales enablement. So they're spending more time at the second half of the funnel than the front half of the funnel because those complex long term enterprise deals need that discipline and rigor mm. for marketing. I mean, look, I mean, we've got a client that their, their addressable market's 140 companies. We don't need to go do more lead gen. We know who they are. And in many cases, they know who we are. And so it's not a matter of like getting them to fill out a form. It's working them through that buying process. There's a large percent of that 140 where we have not adequately challenged the status quo with enough members of the buying committee. Right. And it's not a matter of just having some tool or ROI calculator. Before I can get their engagement, I have to get their attention. Right. Interesting. You already know who they are. And this, I mean, this kind of even ties into ABM. And just you have that known universe. You have your target inside. It's, it's shifting from the you know, get them to fill out that cool form again and again and again. Yeah. You, you've already asked all the questions. Now it's to your point. I love that challenging um, what they already know. It may be yeah. a different buyer in that process. Well, another way to think about this cool. is, you know, it, it, a lot of times marketers confuse access with attention. Right. I have their contact information, right? They filled out a form. Great. Like, so you have access to them, mm -hmm. but you never haven't necessarily done what it takes to earn attention, attention now, attention tomorrow, attention ongoing. Right. So a lot of our sales and marketing is interruptive. How do you, and again, this may feel sound, sound corny, but like, how do you go from being interruptive to irresistible? How do you make your marketing, your messages, your content, something your prospects clamor for? They can't wait to receive. It's not that hard. If you know your audience, if you know what keeps them up at night, if you know the challenges they have, if you know the yeah. content and insights and information that they need to be better at their job, I'm not telling you everyone's going to care about it or everyone's going to want it. This is still a sales funnel and not a, fil a cylinder, right? There's still plenty of people that are going to not have time for you or have other priorities. But I think taking more of that value-added approach and, think and thinking differently about attention versus access and thinking differently about attention versus engagement I may have your attention, but in order to really have a, a qualified conversation, I need that attention to be reciprocated. Right. Engagement is, is, is best defined as a two-way street. Right. So I need to make sure I've got that, and then I leverage that engagement to have that challenging the status quo moment, that insight-based, that reframe-based conversation. And what's exciting about sales and marketing today is it's not like, well, that's a sales call. It's like, no, that can be a blog post. That can be an mm. ROI calculator. It can be listening to a podcast like this. Yeah. So as long as you understand, it's not about the channel as much as it is about the audience and the stage they're at in the buying journey. And if you understand that, that the, 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 the um, intersection between those two things, you can create a message or an insight that appeals to someone that can quite frankly be manifested and communicated in a wide variety of channels in a wide variety of ways. Interesting. I'll, I'll, there's so many things I was writing down there. First of all, you smashed this myth of people <laughs> confusing access with attention. Yes. Right? And the abuses of that equal spam <laughs> complaints right. on email. It, it's, it's gross, unsubscribes, mm -hmm. but then also confusing maybe attention with engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got their attention They're They're, they're looking, but they're yep. not, they're not being, um, they're not reciprocating is what you're saying. So that right. makes sense. And then the, the final one I just got from that tying into personalization, which is the theme too. not, it's not the channel, it's the audience and where they are in the journey. Right. That matters the most. Huh? Cool. Mic drop. There you go. <laughs> I don't want to drop this mic. It was expensive. I don't want to. Yeah. You, you have like a Yeti. <laughs> it's a, it's a Yeti blue. Yeah. I've had this for a while. It's, 
hopefully it's coming. I hope the audience for everyone listening is coming across because I, I love this little thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we might tweak it to make you sound like Jiminy Cricket, you know, when the final. <laughs> <comes out. laughs> good. If you can give me a cool Southern accent, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, I'll give you a Southern accent. Marketing. Hardcore marketing. Shake and bake. Shake and bake. <laughs> that would be kind of fun just to do like a whole show like that. And then all the people listening are like, wait. But what did I click on? I thought I, I thought I clicked on. All right, new product idea. Forget this B two B marketing agency thing. I'm gonna create yeah. what is essentially an auto tuner, but instead of yes. auto tuning your voice, you speak into it, and what comes out can either be Southern, it can be Canadian, it can be like Brooklyn. Like you could totally. Yeah, that'd be fun. But that'd be something, and, and then and you can think about like the market for that. So now you got a bunch of actors you know, that have to learn a dialect. Like, no, you don't. You just like speak into the auto tuner and what comes out is going to be per- perfect South Boston. That'd be awesome. You know, I don't know about South Boston though. Like if you're trying to get a date, I might go Irish, you know, <laughs> get a nice little Irish. Hey, how are well, depending you? on what kind of date you're looking for, you might want to go like, like upper crust of British and just oh. get just that little, little true. Clip. Yeah, they, true. If you, you say the same <laughs> thing with a British accent versus like a, a deep South accent, there's a very wide variety of implied intelligence there. It's not fair, it's but not it's fair. there. You know? It's totally there. Yeah. But you know, it kind of like reminds me of like mirroring people. And sometimes I'm, if I'm chatting with someone from the South, my like Southern roots will just come out and I'll start <laughs> playing with them. Yeah. Uh, but not always. And not with yeah. the guy from New York who wants all about business. Exactly. Um, stop, stop the small talk. Just get to work. Well, you know, they have those apps that, you know, cold callers dial in and it makes it look like it's a local number, right? right. So you're like, oh, maybe it's the school calling right. about exactly. my kids. Yeah. You know, and it's not. It's some guy, it's some SaaS company interrupting your day, thinking he has access to you and he doesn't, right? Yeah. Um, oh, he, he has, has access. I mean, he, he has access. That's true. The phone keeps ringing. He has access, but, but he doesn't have attention. attention. I don't answer it. <laughs> Man, so yeah, I wonder. You're you're exposed to all these different ideas, you know, conferences, and just did the flip the funnel conference, and all these different things going on. You know, what's intriguing you these days? What's kind of captivating you, and and uh, what do you, what do you have your eye on? A couple things. Uh, one, you know, the I mean, we we spent some time talking about how complex B two B selling and marketing is, and how complex the buying process is yeah. in the buying committee. So, we're going along with that complexity is is the complexity of actually measuring what's working. Mm. Right. Um, you know, just because someone downloaded a white paper doesn't mean they want a demo. You know, just because someone downloaded a white paper, that's not you don't give full credit to the seven figure deal because a lead came from a white paper download. Mm-hmm. So attribution of what's working, um, figuring out not just marketing con- contribution, but marketing influence yeah. on revenue. It's really complicated. Like it is got, really complicated. Do you think it's even valid? Because I've heard some people say it's complete bullshit. Well, um, I would agree with part of that statement. I think that um, whether a deal, whether marketing or sales should get credit for a deal, I really don't care about that. Because ultimately in yeah. complex selling, everybody, the, the, the credit belongs to a wide variety of people, right? right? Like marketing did some work, sales did some work, finance did some work, the copywriter who wrote the case study did some work. So credit, I don't worry about. Cool. But in terms of like what's working and what's not, that's what I care about. I want to know how to most efficiently repeat what worked best. Right. I want to create a predictable pipeline that is both predictable and scalable. And for me right. to do that effectively, I have to have greater precision of knowing not just what's working, but what's working in what sequence, to right. create better velocity, right. higher conversion yield and greater cost effectiveness in my sales and marketing. So for that, for that purpose, I think it's really, really important. We have an entire, we have a, a VP, his entire job right now. We stripped everything off his plate earlier this year. And it, he's in, he, all he's working on is marketing performance. And what's interesting is there's a lot of really great vendors working on this, like great yeah. vendors working on this, but the technology is a small fraction of the solution. Like mm-hmm. if you Im- implement a technology oh, okay. tool to help you improve attribution reporting, but if your campaigns are a mess, if your data is a mess, <laughs> yeah. if you're, I mean, if you haven't implemented certain structural foundations inside your business, inside the way you execute, that'll, that provides cleaner data and insights to those tools to be able to give you better insights back. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest themes that's come back to us is it's not just about having better tools. It's about doing better operations. And so yeah. that's where Brian on the marketing performance side has spent a lot of time. I think the, the other thing that we're certainly seeing a lot more this year is Finally, we're seeing CMOs think about the entire customer lifestyle, not just acquisition. 
Got the vast it. majority of B2B marketing budgets are spent acquiring new customers. And then on the customer retention side, you've got a newsletter, uh, a randomly sent, and you know, maybe a toll free number to a couple people that'll answer your questions reactively. Yeah. More and more marketers are looking at lifetime value. They're seeing sales as a lagging indicator of customer success um, and investing in resources accordingly. Um, so I think those, those attribution, better attribution and better lifetime value, customer lifecycle focus is a couple of things we're seeing significantly right now. You know, that's interesting. You mentioned the life cycle because it, it's almost like bringing the product marketers back into the fold, you know, mm -hmm. like they were out there kind of just doing their blast at the customers, letting them know what's up. But it's taken that, hey, we're, we're, get, we're actually getting to know our buyers at the beginning. Yep. Let's, let's, let's stay with them, you know, yep. let's stay with them throughout. You got it. And, and, and use different channels. But let's go back to the multi-touch and the idea mm -hmm. of, measuring performance because you know one of the things we tell people too is like there's some work there but one of the things you can do early on is just at least know where your sort you know your source where you first met that person directionally where they came from to go get more of them hopefully yep but to your point knowing that next step which is what what do they interact with and what yep. you know and i get it you want to make things more optimized um it's hard though, to your point, right? You don't give the white paper all the credit and now you right. have people say, give credit to the beginning and give them to the end and maybe a little to the middle. And you know, how, do you, how, how do you approach all that? Well, where they came from may not matter. I mean, they think about an enterprise deal. Like we did a, um, we just closed a deal with a company that from with a, with a CEO that I met 10 years ago. And it was 10 years <laughs> ago in a negative context. Like she had written to me and she said she was mildly offended by something I'd written on our blog. Oh, so, no. so credit the uh, blog. <laughs> so, so do I give, so if, if, if I'm looking at where the lead came from, I'm saying I closed a deal because of an offensive blog post. Is that really <laughs> you know, what happened? So that may have been where it started. But in the meantime, I think what, what pulled her over was not only the way that I responded, you know, to her, you know, in, in, with empathy to her concern, but yeah. also the way I've stayed in touch, you know, she's stayed in touch with our content. She's gotten our newsletter. So, Interesting. and so, so, you know, over a 10 year period of time, the first touch becomes increasingly irrelevant based on what people are experiencing mm. with you. The and longer it goes, touch, yeah. And a lot of people say, oh, let's, let's look at last touch. Well, last touch may just be the culmination mm -hmm. of all the work in the middle. So yeah. first touch and last touch, having those separated is interesting, but now I've gone, instead of having one of 47 touch points, I've got two of 47 touch points. Yeah. What about the other 45? Right. Right. What were they? And, and not only can you establish a correlation between some of those touches and a short term acceleration in velocity of that deal. So, for instance, did certain content get a higher percent of prospects to go from passive to active with you? Mm -hmm. But is there a sequence of content or a sequence of channels or a sequence of experiences and engagements that tends to most efficiently move your prospects forward? And so I think that's and again, like this isn't. This isn't a reporting exercise. I don't care about the output of this is not reports. The outcome of this is adjustments to your marketing. Mm. Get more of your prospects more efficiently through a similar path. Right. I, sounds like a lot of data though, right? Sounds like yeah. you, you really have to crunch multiple path. You watching everyone. It's almost more of like going back to the day of looking at the overall streams, you know, where are the most successful people coming from. Right. And, how, but, and that's, how are you crunching all that? Well, that's where the tools come in, right? I yeah. mean, that's where, I mean, that is the real value of the tools that are on the market today is right. if you have a present premise of what, what you're looking for, if you can provide those tools with clean data, yeah. they're going to be able to come back to you and crunch that data and say, okay, like here are the trends we're seeing. Here's the strongest correlations. And right. therefore, here's what we think you should double down on. Here's what we think you should reinforce. Here's how to take another sequence that is suboptimal and make some adjustments so it better aligns with the look and feel of the optimal sequences. So it's the outputs and the action items from all that data munging that becomes right. the real valuable part. Yeah. As long as you can, you know, take some tums along with that because that's a, there's a <laughs> lot of data in there. You want to give yourself an answer and not necessarily, you know, like a false correlation to some sort of pathway. Yeah. But you know, I mean, Fraught. perfect is the enemy of good on this stuff. Right. That's I true. Think, uh, That's true. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, intent sometimes is more important than precision on this. And what I mean by that is if you as a marketer are focused on generating leads and not focused on generating revenue, then it will lead you, no pun intended, to focus on some of the wrong things. Totally. I will focus on volume instead of 
instead of conversion. I'll focus on quantity instead of quality. So if you simply, and, and so a big part of driving revenue responsibility amongst marketers is not your actions. It's the culture change in the organization that aligns really behind the right metrics. Because if now all of a sudden, even if I don't know how to precisely measure everything I'm doing on marketing to, to, to influence on, on close deals, yep. I can at least start to prioritize the right actions and the right activities and the right initiative that, that are aligned in that direction. I guarantee you that that will improve. And we have data to support that. There's some research cool. um, by demand metrics that, that looks at a correlation between sales and marketing more closely working together and the company's likelihood of actually hitting their revenue numbers. And it is a direct correlation. The more, you know, the more advanced the integration between sales and marketing, the more likely the company is hitting their revenue numbers. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating to me isn't just the direct correlation, it's the sequence of sales and marketing integration answers. So mm -hmm. you go, so, in it, so you don't go from like no integration between sales and marketing to, in, to, to minimum, to moderate, to advanced, to best. Interesting. The research goes from minimum to inadequate. So minimum to inadequate to minimum. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, so it goes from none to inadequate to minimum to advance. And even going from none to inadequate, you see an increase in revenue performance. In other words, huh. if you go from doing no alignment between sales and marketing to doing it in a shitty way, <laughs> you will improve your revenue. Right. So it's about intent and focus and, and, uh, and pushing people in the right direction and making better decisions based on it. Even huh. if they don't all work out, the, the research shows you will still move the needle in the right direction. Interesting. So you said none, inadequate. Yep. And then it goes to like, you know, minimum, moderate, minimum. advanced. Um, and then just and like that, that I've seen doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily, what I would like as a next step is to say, okay, what are the actions people are prioritizing in each of those things? Like yeah. what, is, what is the actual activity based or like priority based maturity curve from all those things? I don't, the data didn't, that, the data didn't exist for that, unfortunately. Right. But it's a good point. Something, yeah. you know, something, <laughs> something yeah. now is better than perfect exactly. 10 years from now when you're in a different company. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Well, who are you, right? You're on stage, <laughs> sausage, bacon. You, I know you, you cure your own meats. You got to hit you. Everyone on video, you can see he's, he's got it all hanging up over there. Yeah. You know, take us back to little Matt or wherever, you know, how did, how did you, how did you come to be, you know, marketing and now, you know, leading this charge and speaking and, and really helping us evolve, you know, our own mindsets. Casey, this has all been a giant mistake. And I mean yeah. that in the best possible <laughs> way. I, um, I played the piano through high school. My intention was to study the piano at the University of Washington. No um, long story short, I ended up not doing that. My, I, I majored in journalism and political science. Uh, I was a reporter for a suburban Seattle newspaper right out of school. And I was, I was stationed in Olympia, Washington's capital. Washington State's capital, and my job was to basically report on state capital news from the perspective of Ooh. the Olympic Peninsula. And it was cool, but I just, you know, for a variety of reasons, it just wasn't my jam. So I ended up leaving that to go to a PR firm, worked there for a while, went to Microsoft for a while, um, and then ran marketing at a couple of B2B startups, you know, here in Seattle and just really, really enjoyed it. And uh, is, is about 10 years ago. So November of 2008, the market had just tanked. My wife is pregnant with our first child. So of oh, course geez. I quit my job. Of course. Um, Good timing. Well, I mean, the nice thing is I, I, had, <laughs> I had one client lined up and, you know, I was a consultant, right? So what do you yeah. need? It was me and a laptop and a bus pass. For the right. Most and so we made a go at it. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I just had a little bit of experience going in and then just some experience and some confidence and some um, maybe it's just arrogance <laughs> and, uh, and, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, just, we have made a go of it. So yeah, it'll be 10 years in business this November. And, um, honestly, it's a lot of just putting your heart ahead on every day and doing what you enjoy and doing what yeah. you think is going to create value. There was, um, I have never, I have never planned or intended to sort of create a brand for myself or a name for myself. I just like doing work. I just am curious about what's mm -hmm. working and I like writing and sharing and, um, there's been benefits to that for the business clearly, but um, sure. um, I just feel super blessed that I've been able to find something that I enjoy, that I'm a little good at, and um, that I can make a living out of. Yeah, you just do something because it's fun, it's a passion, and yeah. sure enough, it helps other people, and that kind of just reinforces the the good feelings. But it's not like you even necessarily did that. I mean, you just you loved looking into it. That's really cool. Well, that's still what I do. I mean, like yeah. you know, I st I still come to work every day, and I I you know the 
you know, the advice that I give, you know, those, those junior salespeople, like I still read a ton. I still create content and, and write a lot. Um, I'm still working in sales. Do for you my still own play company. the piano? I do still play the piano. So I, um, uh, you know, I played through college, uh, just mostly for fun for, you know, played for some church groups and stuff. And then sure. you know, once I got out in the, in the work world, um, had a digital piano for a while, eventually got rid of it. And just earlier this year, for the first time in almost 20 years, I now have a real piano again. So, um, really, yeah. So it's, it was, it was actually quite frightening because, you know, I, I, you know, I, I played a lot early on and I played, you know, played concertos and did the whole thing. And um, I was very nervous about picking it back up because I knew I was going to be bad (laughs) and I'm still not where I was, but I, the, 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 it's kind of like getting back on a bike. It kind of, you know, your fingers kind of recognize what it's going to do. And um, it's been, and with three young kids, you know, to have them come down and listen to me play and have my, you know, my daughter is now joined the quieter school. And so we're able to sort of practice stuff at home. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I was going to say, I, I wondered if it was like riding a bike, you know, and uh, did, did the fingers um, remember they maybe just needed to get a little more limber, but how, what was that like? Well, it's, um, it, it was, it, it, quite frankly, it's still a work in progress. You yeah. know, I don't, you know, I wish I had, you know, a couple hours a day to play, but you know, given a, you know, family and a busy schedule and travel, it's not as much as I want, sure. but like I'll, I'll go down and I'll play, you know, quite a bit. And I think I'll, I'll there's a couple pieces, um, that I've really kind of focused on. Like whenever I play, I play them. So yeah. I can, my, my mind can get comfortable with them. So those become pieces that I can kind of play without needing the music after a while. What kind of um, favorites do you have? Or, or um, it's a wide variety of stuff, man. I mean, I, um, there, I've got some John Legend where I've got some of his music that, that I don't know who did the arrangement, but it's pretty close to what you hear on the recordings of his. Um, so I like that a lot. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of, there's, there's some of, uh, so we're a big fan of Michael W. Smith and some of his music. Dude, me um, too, man. And he's done I some. him. He's done some instrumental albums that are just out of this world. And yes. so I got a book of his that is the piano arrangement of some of his instrumental music that has just been a lot of fun to play. Huh. Um, and then just random stuff that, you know, that we like, like my, uh, you know, my kids, uh, my, my, my daughter is a big fan of Frozen. So I've got the Frozen oh, yeah. soundtrack and play that for her. And uh, totally. it's just been fun. I, I, um, I'm a bit of a mutt when it comes to genres. Like I, you know, I'll play some classical, I'll play some jazz, I'll do some, I've got a, this, this, don't judge me at this point, but I've got a Yanni uh, songbook that I actually like. Dude, we're like, yeah, we're we're related somehow. Of course. Uh, And then I've got a book of, um, Live with uh, the Acropolis. Yeah, geez. Um, (laughs) And then I've got, um, and then I've got uh, a book of uh, Scott Joplin, uh, Ragtime. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, That's, that's one where that one and Claire de Lune, um, are the two that I'm really working on to sort of get my technique back up to speed. Mm. Not quite where I want it to be, but um, it's a lot of fun. I mean, at the end of a busy day, the kids go down, um, you know, I, I'm down at the, I'm down at the piano with a, with the scotch, just, just playing. It's fun. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. I'm that, I was like, that was missing in that picture for me. That, <laughs> now little, it's little perfect. I see it down there. there. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just the good way to relax the it is. It's songs. Good. And you know what? You rock out. So Michael Levy Smith, friends are friends forever. Not a dry eye in the in the room, you know. No, that's there's, awesome. not, there's not, and that's that's one of my wife's favorite songs. And so I did, yeah. I did, I found an arrangement of that one that I really like that she likes. So uh, it's fun. Oh, you know what? Um, there's a song, um, one of his songs actually that uh, I'll, I'll have to look it up. But yeah, it was one of the ones that um, it's kind of like a love song. But uh, we, uh, the wife and I, had it for our like our our first dance song it was a Michael. Oh, did you? Song. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Did you know that he? Um, I didn't know this till last night. He published an album that's called Lullaby, and huh. so he's taken songs out of his own catalog, and arranged them as literally songs you can play for your kids to help them go to sleep. So they're all okay. quieter. The, his he's singing softer, tends to be a little maybe a higher octave on the piano for certain parts of the song. Huh. Um, it's pretty cool, yeah. I'll have to check that out. That sounds yeah. really cool, yeah. Lullaby, awesome. So, th- so yeah, yeah, yeah. For a second, I was th- picturing you like in the office. Maybe you had like an organ. So, you're, like <laughs> you're like the dark phantom of the opera. Wow. You know, you slam your door shut and just go. Or, 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 ca- Captain Nemo on on the Nautilus, <laughs> right? Like yes. the organ at the end. No, of the that would be fun. I, you know, there there are some. <laughs> There are some songs where they just, it just, you know, you just, just you're, you're, you're expected to bang on the piano to get them out. But um, no, it's just, it's just a, it's, a, it's to be able to play the way I want to play. I literally can't think about work. I just have to focus on the music, and that's, uh, it's to me, it's kind of like reading a book. Like a good book just kind of takes you to another world. For me, sitting down playing the piano just allows me to do the same thing. 
definitely now for me it's like listening to some good music or even some mm-hmm. good worship music when i just poof, you're off yep. somewhere especially with nice weather outside you know it's just like exactly perfect but i agree you know we were chatting earlier i think this kind of ties in we were just kind of sort of ha- just chatting about how you know, as, as you get older and you know we've done the company's thing for a while you start to realize what success is and maybe mm-hmm. that's playing piano with your kids yeah. listening in and a little scotch as well you yeah. know yeah. but like not necessarily being on the road 90,000 yeah. days out of the year right and and i think you're saying you're getting more intentional about all of that I am. Um, you know, two years ago, I did about 100,000 travel miles and I could justify and I could Yay. still justify every one of them. But yep. I'll do, you know, half of that is still a lot, but I'll do about half of that this year. I'm just saying no to more things and being a little yeah. more picky about what takes me out of, you know, away from the away from the family. Um, and even when I'm home, um, you know, there's a difference between, you know, nights you sleep in your bed and nights you get to put your kids down you know, and so to be able to, hmm. you know, do story time, bath time and put my kids to bed um, requires me not to do as many evening events in town as I used to do as well. And so, yeah, you're, if, if, if I'm missing out on a conference here, they're missing out on a networking event somewhere like there's, there's opportunities I'm missing, but I've, I've, the older I've gotten and the more mistakes I've made, I realize I sometimes have to choose what's most important. And at this stage in this season of my life, you know, being with my family and spending more time with them is important. So less time on the road. There are certain business opportunities that I've foregone or stalled that, you know, maybe slowing down our growth, but I don't care because I get to go yeah. spend time with my family. Um, so that, you know, that has sometimes been easier said than done. And it's been a sure. bit of a journey to help me get there. I, I certainly was not there for a healthy first portion of my career past, but um, yeah. You know, I think with my, my kids are nine, seven, and five, and they're still at an age where they all want to spend time with daddy. And you know what? Daddy wants to spend time with them. So, you know, I know that as they get older, they'll have their friends and other things they're doing. And um, I just don't want to miss this season. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, all the all the people that are, you know, way, way past us in the journey, you know, they all say, like, you know, the regret is, like, you know, spending more time on those things, you yeah. know, and all the songs. I don't even know who sings that song, but, but you know, hey, let's play ball, Dad, and, yeah, oh, I can't right now, and then. That's in the cradle. I, yeah, I, uh, there you go. I've known that. I remember listening to that song. And, Do you play that? <laughs> uh, I don't even think I have that one, but, um, I mean, depressing, I it. So you don't I, have it to. is. It is very depressing. Um, I think my dad played it to him for me once, and, you know, my dad was, my dad was a hard, hard worker. Like my family's mm. from the West and he's me too. You know, taught me, you know, the, the value of hard work. Um, but he was home. He coached my little league team. Like he would bring work home, but he was, he was around and he was with us. And, and I've come to realize that, you know, you know, being, being there for your kids doesn't mean you're there all the time. You're not at every mm-hmm. practice. You're not at every game, but when they get older, they'll remember you made an effort. You were at games. They remember you at games. That was me. Right. Um, yeah. They remember you so, being there. Exactly. Now it's yeah. important. You know, for me, you know, my dad was, is in the military and uh, he certainly had the option to travel around once we got into junior high and high school. Um, but it, it got to the point where we didn't, you know, and it was yep. better for us to not move around at that point in our lives, you know, have some friends, you know, build some things out and probably not so good for his career. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, I always looking back, I respected the fact that he was thinking about, you know, what was really important, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know we were chatting about even Elon, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge mm-hmm. SpaceX fan. Yeah. I bought Tesla just mm-hmm. on principle. It was mm-hmm. a shaky investment, but I was like, no, you just, just do it. I'm, I'm in, yeah. man. Let's take us to Mars. But yeah. you know, he was in the news, right. With some, well, he's some expressed work. some, a little bit of regret with some of the sp- places he spent time and, um, you know, kind of choked up a little bit with the New York times reporter talking about, you know, missing his birthday cause he was at the office and, sometimes being at the factory for days on end and worried about the impact that has on his kids. I'm like, well, of course it does, you know, and of course, um, yeah. you know, I think you just, you can't have it all. And so I look yeah. at a situation like that. I'm like, you know, here's a guy that we see as sort of the modern Henry Ford, right? Like someone who is just innovating everywhere he turns. Um, but there's a sacrifice he's making mm-hmm. to do that. And if he's okay with that sacrifice, then fine. Right. But in that interview, I think we saw a window that there's more that he might want. So, you know, I look at that and I think about, I think about my, you know, my priorities and my career and my choices. I'm like, what do you want and what are you willing to sacrifice to get that? Like, right. would he be willing to sacrifice either control of his business or trajectory of his business to have more time with friends and family? I guess in that same interview, he brought up the idea of, 
you know, what should he hire a COO? And he kind of poo-pooed the idea, which tells me that sort of mentally he's still not ready to relinquish control. He's still like, he's not willing to sacrifice right. the business to have what he clearly um, covets in his personal life. Um, and seeing that, it just kind of makes me sad. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, clearly super smart, super successful guy, but there's more that he wants and it's right there for him. And, you know, especially when it comes to your kids, like, you know, hopefully your kids live a long life, but they're going to be that formative age for only right now. Yeah. And that's not, you know, if you say, Hey, listen, I'll go get a girlfriend later. Or, you know what? I mean, for years I said, you know, I'll buy a piano down the road. Like as the kids get older and I have more time, I'll play more golf and I'll get a piano. Well, those are things you can pick up later. I was a crappy yeah. golfer before I had kids. I'll be a crappy golfer when I pick it up again. Right. <laughs> um, right. But, but there are certain things that you cannot delay and um, you only have one chance at those. So right. well, we went from marketing attribution to prioritizing family. This is a yeah, man. podcast here, Hardcore. man. Hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are you working on, right? We talk about what intrigues you, but I know you've got some projects. You're, you're working on a book and yep. Obviously, you're super busy, but in the family time too. But tell us, tell us about what you're working at, you know, with Heinz Marketing and yep. your new initiatives. So our big focus right now is on this what we call the predictable pipeline, yeah. and it's it's not just you know doing doing marketing activity. We really we've we've identified with the work we do with clients and just the research we've done in the market, we've identified seven core focus areas that really create that help companies create more predictability. Mm. and and consistency and scalability of their sales pipeline efforts right and it's inherently from our perspective it's inherently a marketing sort of driven uh sort of methodology mm -hmm. but if you look at it it's not it's not explicitly marketing it's something right. that marketing and sales and the organization the go-to-market organization can share um together and so we've been you know so the, the next book is is going to be on this topic we've developed a workshop around it we use it as a methodology to engage with cool. clients to help understand where they're at and where they need to be focused you know, some companies are really good at uh, knowing who their target market is, but not good at sort of managing the sales cycle. Some companies are really good at organizing their team, but not really good at coordinating the messages the teams are using mm -hmm. in an integrated way across channels. So, you know, you get into some tactics, but, you know, you get into a tactics that are focused on the right outcome and that are prioritized based on the strength and weakness of how you're already executing. Right. Right. Focus is so important too, especially if you're, there's so many things out there and, you know, tech vendors saying, look at me, you know, and <laughs> it's like, okay, it, it, it's cool, but let's make yeah. sure we get your ducks in a row before you start, you know, spending the dollars, investing that money. That type That's of right. Excellent. So that is that going to be like an ebook coming out or is this like it's going to be a full on book? No, this will be the book. real deal. So Ooh. at this point, you know, we're looking at you know, kind of spring of next year launch. You got all the marketing conferences coming up. So it's, it's, you know, the content itself is something we already talk about and promote. Right. But we're just, you know, as we get more and more examples of how it works, uh, more and more stories of sort of the before and afters, um, you know, we've got the long form content. We're now sort of stitching together. So yeah, excited to get that out. Yeah. So when next year you said about springtime? Springtime. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at sort of aligning it with some of the spring conferences that you have from, you know, Marketo and from, you know, Serious mm -hmm. Decisions. And um, yeah, I think that that's in, in when you, when you now we've done some self-published books, but as we now, you know, work with publishers, uh, mm -hmm. the timelines get a little off further out. So. Are you doing one of those like, like, like Riley or Wiley or? Yeah. I don't have a lot of details to share yet, but yeah. Oh, it's kind of on the, uh, well, the it's not, you know, it's just, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll still sort of a lot of moving parts to all make yeah. it happen. Um, but well, that's how you know it's important is when you've got stuff you can't quite say, right? Yeah. Well, it's not just that I can't say, it's just that it's just some, some of those details aren't all figured out yet. Not even figured out. Yeah. I, I know yeah. how that goes. So it's just, yeah. uh, you know, this, as we mentioned earlier, from a sales standpoint, the sausage making, you know, uh, behind all this is always, uh, you know, I would be remiss if I let you get a, you said sausage now like four times. So <laughs> I've been keeping track. Little, little tick yeah, marks. Yeah. Just, just hit, let it, you know, tell me about bacon, sausage. Yeah. How, how did you get into that? I, I got to know. Uh, you know, it, it, like a lot of things, it was kind of incremental. Um, you know, I've always, <laughs> my wife and I both like to cook. And, yeah. um, you know, for years and years, I was just a, you know, a gas grill guy. And then, um, you know, charcoal always seemed kind of intimidating. And so, the, you know, my, my, my charcoal Weber that grill was my, was my gateway to getting into, you know, meat smoking. So oh I God. now have, um, I have five different grills and smokers at home, you know, every <laughs> Everything from, you know, your standard Weber kettle to an 800 pound uh, uh, two level offset smoker Jeez. that I can do like 50 pounds of bacon at a time. So I just, it's just, a, it's a hobby. Yeah. It also feeds my family and feeds family and friends, you know, for parties yeah. and such. So um, yeah, we, we um, 
we make our own, um, and it's not just barbecue now. Like, you know, we make our own sausage, make our own bacon, we make our own yeah. pickles. We do a lot of, you know, food projects. Um, and then, um, you know, like, you know, coming up here in a couple of weeks, we've got, uh, you know, Beth's, my wife's a teacher. And so she's invited her teacher, uh, her, some of her colleagues and their families over. And so we're going to put some pulled pork on the, on the smoke, oh, yeah. put some chicken, half chickens out there and, Jeez. and just do it right. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. It's just another hobby that, you know, has side benefits for other, everyone else that shows up when it's done. You know, like as I'm thinking about, Elon could learn a couple of things from you. You got a little piano action, you <laughs> woken up a storm, bacon, and making me hungry, and I already had lunch. But like <laughs> all these things, yeah, and you got the work that's inspiring you. It just yeah. it sounds like you're just staying in the zone of the things that intrigue and inspire you. Well, I, I, I appreciate you saying that, and I appreciate that it looks maybe look that way from the outside. I think <laughs> it's always more complicated and more diverse. You know, totally. it's the way things actually get executed. But uh, like you know, at this point in my life, I just feel so incredibly blessed to, right. um, you know, first and foremost have uh, have my health, have my faith, have my family, um, to have the 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 wife and kids that I have. It's just that is it's overwhelmingly um, humbling, um, yeah. and then also to have a business that supports that to have people on a team here that, uh, that make this a really fun place to be, you know, exciting to come to work in the morning, but proud of ourselves when we go home. Yeah. Um, and you know, they're, you know, it's exciting and terrifying and there are good days and there are <laughs> challenging days as you know, but it's, um, man, it's, uh, it's, it's, I feel very blessed. It's pretty fun. Well, that's awesome. Where are you, where are you next? Uh, like physically, physically. Yeah. We, um, I, I know you're at events all the time. Yeah. So as, as as we record this, it's the week, uh, a couple of days before Labor Day. Um, so, True. It's very so, evergreen content, other than this very part right now. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so this weekend, I will be spending the majority of my time on a couch watching the first week of college football. And Hell like, yeah. Football uh, went to University of Washington. Go dogs. So uh, big game against Auburn this Saturday. Oh, so excited geez. for that. Auburn's uh, good, though, aren't they? I mean, they're... Well, they're both top 10 teams here. Like, I think preseason, Huskies yeah. are six, Auburn's nine. Um, I mean, they, they, the line as of this morning is like a, is is one and a half for Auburn. It's pretty tight, so it's, it should be a really good game. Jeez. Um, so yeah, so then you know the, the travel heats up a little bit next week. We'll be at Content Marketing World in Cleveland. Okay. Um, oh, Ohio. I get something cool Ohio. happening in Ohio. Apparently, that's right. That's right. Content Marketing um, World. The uh, Dreamforce Salesforce Conference coming up at the end of the month. Yeah. And then um, we're doing a we're doing a road show uh, this this for, for most of this fall as well. We're doing a number of cities going and doing some CMO breakfast. And so inviting oh, cool. CMOs into some cool rooms with some bacon and eggs and just you know sort of you know no uh, no pitches no decks just doing it as sort of a peer conversation about that's cool we're going to be to be and what people are planning for next year. So yeah, start to hit the road a little bit more. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just you know excited about what we have ahead. Cool, man. Well, I'll be over there at Dreamforce too. So maybe we'll link up and get some uh, beers or something. That'd be great. I'll bring bacon. Depending on time yeah. of day. Yeah, exactly. Cool, cool. Hey, throw out some links too. We'll, we'll throw yeah. them in the show notes. But where can people connect with you, learn more about Heinz Marketing? You know, where, where should they go? You can go to HeinzMarketing.com. It's just H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. It's our main website. We've got a lot of content up there. You can get our best practice guides, a lot of our research, all available for free. Good deal. You want to check out our podcast. Uh, we, our podcast is called Sales Pipeline Radio. You can get it at SalesPipelineRadio.com. All our past episodes, all are archived up there. Awesome. Um, Twitter, at Heinz Marketing. Uh, we're curating tons of sales and marketing and personal productivity advice up there on a regular basis. And if you want to talk to me, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T, at HeinzMarketing.com. Awesome. There it is. There it is. Thanks. Man, this has been awesome. It's been fun, man. Thank you very much. It's a good conversation. We did cover, we cover it when we can go from advanced B2B marketing to bacon to college football to faith and music. I mean, that's that's a good hour. That's a real good hour. Yeah. <laughs> totally, man. At, at any one of those, we could have spiraled off and gone down a deep rabbit hole, but somehow yeah. we we kept it together. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been great, man. Thank you again so much. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, everybody out there, if you learned something today and there's no way you didn't, then share this with someone. Get them the info so they can break out of some of those molds they've been in. Uh, share this with someone. But other than that, we'll see you all next time. This has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. Catch you later. Bye.